In an earlier example, you might remember that I pointed out that in E1 scenarios, we can get carbocation rearrangements. Here's another one. I've got a bromine attached to this position, and it's reacting with a weak base, methanol. No localized negative charges on this. Thus, it's going to proceed by an E1 mechanism. It stirs around in solution. This bromine falls off and gives me a secondary carbocation here. Now, what in the world can happen next? Well, you'll note that if I have a hydride march from this position and plug itself into this carbocation hole, it gives me this molecule. This is a secondary allylic carbocation, which is way more stable than a secondary carbocation. Hence, this 1,2 hydride shift does occur. When my weak base, this methanol, eventually gets around to doing the elimination, it does so with this more stable carbocation intermediate to give me this product. Here's another scenario. I've got a chlorine at this position being reacted under E1 conditions. That is, I've got a weak base, methanol. Stirring in solution, this chlorine takes off, gives me a secondary carbocation here. What can happen? Well, this methyl group can walk next door and plug this hole, giving me this tertiary carbocation intermediate, which is more stable than the secondary. Now, this isn't just any boring kind of tertiary carbocation. In addition to being a tertiary carbocation, this is also a benzylic tertiary carbocation. That is, I can resonance delocalize this positive charge at three additional positions in this benzene ring. So this is very, very much more stable than the secondary carbocation, all through this 1,2-methyl shift. When my weak base, the methanol, gets around to doing an elimination, the final product that I end up getting is this one. So what's the point of this slide? The point of the slide is, under E1 conditions, a leaving group takes off first and gives me a carbocation. Because of that, I can have 1,2-methyl or 1,2-hydride shifts if doing so will give me a more stable intermediate prior to getting to the final elimination product. That does not occur with E2 reactions. With E2 reactions, there's no carbocation intermediate formed. All that occurs is a base comes in, grabs a proton, pumps the electrons down, kicks off the leaving group, and all in one fell swoop. Wha-bam! Because there's no carbocation intermediate in an E2 reaction, there's no possibility for a 1,2 hydride or 1,2 methyl shift. There's another nuance we need to consider when we think about E2 reactions. As I've mentioned earlier, in order for an E2 reaction, the bonds of the eliminated groups, this hydrogen that's getting removed and the leaving group, which is abbreviated as X here, have to be in the same plane. However, they also have to be anti to each other. So I cannot do an elimination if my hydrogen that's going to be eliminated and my leaving group are both pointing in the same direction, in other words, cis to each other. They have to be trans to each other or anti to each other as drawn in this Newman projection. Now, not only do they have to be anti to each other, they also have to be in the exact same plane. Well, why in the world does that matter? I'll show you momentarily, but remember the take home message. Sin elimination, which is shown at the left, doesn't really work. Anti elimination, shown at the right, does under E2 circumstances. Here's another view of that. I want you to imagine that my leaving group is stuck to this carbon, and the hydrogen to be eliminated is stuck to this carbon. If this hydrogen and this leaving group are both in the same plane as each other, but are cis to each other, this would be called sin elimination. And remember, sin is bad. You cannot do this type of elimination. In contrast, if this leaving group had been rotated so that it was planar to the hydrogen that was going to be eliminated, but pointing trans relative to it, this type of elimination, called anti-elimination, does indeed work in an E2 reaction. Once again, sin elimination, shown at left, doesn't work in an E2. Anti-elimination does. We often say, then, that the H and the leaving group X have to be anti-paraplanar. They have to be anti to each other, and they have to be in the same plane. So you might ask, why in the world does that matter? In a lot of circumstances, it doesn't. But in some, it does. I want you to imagine, for instance, that you have a cyclohexane ring. In a ringed structure, you cannot freely rotate around the carbon-carbon single bonds as readily as you would in a straight chain. 
If you want to do an elimination on a ring, the hydrogen, of course, that's to be eliminated, has to be in the same plane and anti to the leaving group. In other words, they have to be anti paraplanar to each other in order for the elimination to occur in an E2 reaction. In the case of a cyclohexane ring, these two groups would have to be axial to each other. This example will show us that a little bit further. I want you to imagine that I've got a leaving group, this chlorine, that's equatorial. Is there any way to have a hydrogen on any of the adjacent carbons, either this one here or this one down here, be anti-periplanar to an equatorial leaving group? The answer is no, you can't. So what that means is if I treat this with a base, under E2 conditions, I end up getting no elimination occurring. What has to occur first is this molecule has to undergo a ring flip so that I get the leaving group chlorine in the less stable axial position. Now while I realize that the equatorial position will be more favored in this equilibrium, once you get the chlorine in the axial position, it now is anti-paraplanar to a hydrogen next door. At this point, a base can come, grab this hydrogen, bond with it, thrust these electrons down here to form a carbon-carbon double bond and kick off the chloride in one fell swoop, E2 style, to give me this product. Does that make sense? Good. Let's look at some examples. I want you to draw the chair conformations necessary for each of the following chlorocyclohexanes to do an E2 reaction. Then draw the E2 products. Here's the first example. I've got this chair structure and I'm treating it with a strong base. E2 conditions. Does this chlorine have a hydrogen next door that is anti-paraplanar to it? Of course it does because the chlorine is in the axial position. So can an E2 reaction occur on this ring as drawn? Yes, it can. The base will come in, form a bond with this hydrogen, thrust the electrons down here, forming a carbon-carbon double bond, and kick off the chloride. You will, of course, also get elimination across this carbon-carbon bond as well. But the major product will be the one between these two positions because it gives you the more stable alkene by Zaitsev's rule. Let's look at this example. You'll notice that this chlorine here is not axial. Thus, there are no hydrogens on the carbons next door to it that are anti-paraplanar to the chlorine. In order to do an elimination with this ring, I have to first do a ring flip that will place the chlorine in an axial configuration, and then I can do the elimination. I am not going to draw that for you here, but we'll let you do that on your own. Okay, so I've just got done telling you guys that in order to do an elimination on a ring, under E2 conditions, the leaving group has to be axial. The reason for that is because that's the only position in which you can have a hydrogen next door that is anti-paraplanar to the leaving group. What about under E1 conditions? Do I have to have my leaving group be axial if I'm doing an E1? The answer is no. In E1 reactions, it doesn't matter if the H and X groups are anti-paraplanar. The reason is because under E1 conditions, a leaving group takes off and gives me a carbocation. And you can eliminate the hydrogen into the carbocation regardless of whether or not the hydrogen or the leaving group were originally starting out anti-paraplanar. So our leaving group X does not have to be in the axial position in an E1 reaction. Let's look at this example. I've got a chlorine being treated with a weak base, methanol, under E1 conditions. You'll note, of course, that this chlorine is not in an axial position. Now, if I were doing this under E2 conditions, that would matter. Because these aren't E2 conditions, it doesn't. These are E1 conditions, so the chlorine stirs around until the chloride takes off, giving me a carbocation at this position. Once you have a carbocation at that position, your weak base, the methanol in this case, has no problems grabbing a hydrogen next door and pumping the electrons down in to fill the hole to give me my elimination product, shown here. So once again, the take home is this. Under E2 conditions, your hydrogen and your leaving group have to be anti-paraplanar to each other. And in a ring, that means that the leaving group has to be axial. Under E1 conditions, however, it doesn't matter because the leaving group takes off first, giving you a carbocation. And once you've got a carbocation, the base can grab a hydrogen next door and pump those electrons down into it. No sweat. 
even if the leaving group was originally in an equatorial position. So once again, an axial orientation is not required for E1 reactions. Okay, one more topic on this ring thing, and then we'll call it good for this lecture. As you've seen before, under E1 conditions, carbocation rearrangements, 1,2 hydride or 1,2 methyl shifts, can occur. Do you think that applies to rings? Yeah, it does. But once again, it only applies to E1 reactions, not E2s. Let me show you this example. I've got a bromine stuck here. Weak base, obviously E1 conditions. My bromine can take off, giving me a secondary carbocation. You'll notice, of course, that a hydrogen from next door can march over here, 1,2 hydride shift style, to give me now a tertiary carbocation. At this point, the elimination will occur. The base grabs this hydrogen here, pumping the electrons down here to give me my major, more substituted alkene product. This can totally occur under E1 conditions. If I did this under E2 conditions with a strong reactive base, then I would see no carbocation rearrangements. And the reason is because there's no carbocation formed. The base comes in, grabs the hydrogen, pumps the electrons down, kicks off the leaving group, single step in one fell swoop. No carbocation is generated, thus there are no carbocation rearrangements. All right, well that brings us to the end of this discussion. Please tune in for our next one, where I will finally teach you guys how to distinguish between E1, E2, SN1, and SN2 reactions. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.